This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2007. God and the State by Mikhail Bakunin Chapter 1 who is right, the idealists or the materialists? The question once stated in this way, hesitation becomes impossible. Undoubtedly the idealists are wrong and the materialists right. Yes, facts are before ideas. Yes, the ideal, as Proudhon said, is but a flower whose root lies in the material conditions of existence. Yes, the whole history of humanity intellectual and moral, political and social, is but a reflection of its economic history. All branches of modern science, of true and disinterested science, concur in proclaiming this grand truth, fundamental and decisive. The social world, properly speaking, the human world, in short, humanity, is nothing other than the last and supreme development at least on our planet, and as far as we know, the highest manifestation of animality. But, as every development necessarily implies a negation, that of its base or point of departure, humanity is at the same time and essentially the deliberate and gradual negation of the animal element in man. And it is precisely this negation, as rational as it is natural, and rational only because natural, at once historical and logical, as inevitable as the development and realization of all the natural laws in the world that constitutes and creates the ideal, the world of intellectual and moral convictions, ideas. Yes, our first ancestors, our Adams and our Eves, were, if not gorillas, very near relatives of gorillas, omnivorous, intelligent and ferocious beasts, endowed in a higher degree than the animals of other species with two precious faculties, the power to think and the desire to rebel. These faculties, combining their progressive action in history, represent the essential factor, the negative power in the positive development of human animality, and create consequently all that constitutes humanity in man. The Bible, which is a very interesting and here and there very profound book, when considered as one of the oldest surviving manifestations of human wisdom and fancy, expresses this truth very naively in its myth of original sin. Jehovah, who of all the good gods adored by men was certainly the most jealous, the most vain, the most ferocious, the most unjust, the most bloodthirsty, the most despotic, and the most hostile to human dignity and liberty, Jehovah had just created Adam and Eve to satisfy we know not what caprice, no doubt to while away his time, which must weigh heavy on his hands in his eternal egoistic solitude, or that he might have some new slaves. He generously placed at their disposal the whole earth, with all its fruits and animals, and set but a single limit to this complete enjoyment. He expressly forbade them from touching the fruit of the tree of knowledge. He wished, therefore, that man, destitute of all understanding of himself, should remain an eternal beast, ever on all fours before the eternal God, his creator and his master. But here steps in Satan, the eternal rebel, the first free thinker and the emancipator of worlds. He makes man ashamed of his bestial ignorance and obedience. He emancipates him, stamps upon his brow the seal of liberty and humanity, in urging him to disobey and eat of the fruit of knowledge. We know what followed. The good God, whose foresight, which is one of the divine faculties, should have warned him of what would happen, flew into a terrible and ridiculous rage. He cursed Satan, man, and the world created by himself, striking himself, so to speak, in his own creation, as children do when they get angry. And, not content with smiting our ancestors themselves, he cursed them in all the generations to come, innocent of the crime committed by their forefathers. Our Catholic and Protestant theologians look upon that as very profound and very just, precisely because it is monstrously iniquitous and absurd. Then, 
remembering that he was not only a god of vengeance and wrath, but also a god of love, after having tormented the existence of a few milliards of poor human beings, and condemned them to an eternal hell, he took pity on the rest, and to save them and reconcile his eternal and divine love with his eternal and divine anger, always greedy for victims and blood, he sent into the world as an expiatory victim his only son, that he might be killed by men. That is called the mystery of the redemption, the basis of all the Christian religions. Still, if the divine Saviour had saved the human world, but no, in the paradise promised by Christ, as we know, such being the formal announcement, the elect will number very few. The rest, the immense majority of the generations present and to come, will burn eternally in hell. In the meantime, to console us, God, ever just, ever good, hands over the earth to the government of the Napoleon the Thirds, of the William the Firsts, of the Ferdinands of Austria, and of the Alexanders of all the Russias. Such are the absurd tales that are told, and the monstrous doctrines that are taught, in the full light of the 19th century, in all the public schools of Europe, at the express command of the government. They call this civilising the people. Is it not plain that all these governments are systematic poisoners, interested stupefiers of the masses? I have wandered from my subject, because anger gets hold of me whenever I think of the base and criminal means which they employ to keep the nations in perpetual slavery, undoubtedly that they may be the better able to fleece them. Of what consequence are the crimes of all the Trotmans in the world, compared with this crime of treason against humanity committed daily, in broad day, over the whole surface of the civilised world, by those who dare call themselves the guardians and fathers of the people? I return to the myth of original sin. God admitted that Satan was right. He recognised that the devil did not deceive Adam and Eve in promising them knowledge and liberty as a reward for the act of disobedience which he had induced them to commit. For, immediately they had eaten of the forbidden fruit, God himself said, see Bible, Behold, man is become as of the gods, knowing both good and evil. Prevent him, therefore, from eating of the fruit of eternal life, lest he become immortal like ourselves. Let us disregard now the fabulous portion of this myth and consider its true meaning, which is very clear. Man has emancipated himself. He has separated himself from animality and constituted himself a man. He has begun his distinctively human history and development by an act of disobedience and science, that is, by rebellion and by thought. Three elements, or, if you like, three fundamental principles constitute the essential condition of all human development, collective or individual, in history. 1. Human animality. 2. Thought. And 3. Rebellion. To the first properly corresponds social and private economy. To the second, science. To the third, liberty. Idealists of all schools aristocrats and bourgeois, theologians and metaphysicians, politicians and moralists, religionists, philosophers or poets, not forgetting the liberal economists, unbounded worshippers of the ideal, as we know, are much offended when told that man, with his magnificent intelligence, his sublime ideas and his boundless aspirations, is, like all else existing in the world, nothing but matter, only a product of vile matter. We may answer that the matter of which materialists speak, matter spontaneously and eternally mobile, active, productive, matter chemically or organically determined and manifested by the properties of forces, mechanical, physical, animal and intelligent, which necessarily belong to it, that this matter has nothing in common with the vile matter of the idealists. The latter, a product of their false abstraction, is indeed a stupid, inanimate, immobile thing, incapable of giving birth to the smallest product, a caput mortuum, an ugly fancy, in contrast to the beautiful fancy which they call God. As the opposite of this supreme being, matter, their matter, stripped by that which constitutes its real nature, necessarily represents supreme nothingness. 
They have taken away intelligence, life, all its determining qualities, active relations or forces, motion itself, without which matter would not even have weight, leaving it nothing but impenetrability and absolute immobility in space. They have attributed all these natural forces, properties and manifestations to the imaginary being created by their abstract fancy. Then, interchanging roles, they have called this product of their imagination, this phantom, this god who is nothing, supreme being, and, as a necessary consequence, have declared that the real being, matter, the world, is nothing. After which they gravely tell us that this matter is incapable of producing anything, not even of setting itself in motion, and consequently must have been created by their god. At the end of this book I exposed the fallacies and truly revolting absurdities to which one is inevitably led by this imagination of a god. Let him be considered as a personal being, the creator and organiser of worlds, or even as impersonal, a kind of divine soul spread over the whole universe and constituting thus its eternal principle. Or let him be an idea, infinite and divine, always present and active in the world, and always manifested by the totality of material and definite beings. Here I shall deal with one point only. The gradual development of the material world, as well as of organic animal life, and of the historically progressive intelligence of man, individually or socially, is perfectly conceivable. It is a wholly natural movement from the simple to the complex, from the lower to the higher, from the inferior to the superior, a movement in conformity with all our daily experiences, and consequently in conformity also with our natural logic, with the distinctive laws of our mind, which, being formed and developed only by the aid of these same experiences, is, so to speak, but the mental, cerebral reproduction or reflected summary thereof. The system of the idealists is quite the contrary of this. It is the reversal of all human experiences, and of that universal and common good sense which is the essential condition of all human understanding, and which, in rising from the simple and unanimously recognised truth that twice two are four, to the sublimest and most complex scientific considerations, admitting, moreover, nothing that has not stood the severest tests of experience or observation of things and facts, becomes the only serious basis of human knowledge. Very far from pursuing the natural order from the lower to the higher, from the inferior to the superior, and from the relatively simple to the more complex, instead of wisely and rationally accompanying the progressive and real movement from the world called inorganic to the world organic, vegetable, animal, and then distinctively human, from chemical matter or chemical being to living matter or living being, and from living being to thinking being, the idealists, obsessed, blinded, and pushed on by the divine phantom which they have inherited from theology, take precisely the opposite course. They go from the higher to the lower, from the superior to the inferior, from the complex to the simple. They begin with God, either as a person or as a divine substance or idea. And the first step that they take is a terrible fall from the sublime heights of the eternal ideal into the mire of the material world, from absolute perfection into absolute imperfection, from thought to being, or rather, from supreme being to nothing. When, how and why the divine being, eternal, infinite, absolutely perfect, probably weary of himself, decided upon this desperate salto mortale, is something which no idealist, no theologian, no metaphysician, no poet has ever been able to understand himself or explain to the profane. All religions, past and present, and all the systems of transcendental philosophy hinge on this unique, iniquitous mystery. Footnote. I call it iniquitous because, as I believe I have proved in the appendix alluded to, this mystery has been and still continues to be the consecration of all the horrors which have been and are being committed in the world. I call it unique because all other theological and metaphysical absurdities which debase the human mind are but its necessary consequences. End footnote. Holy men, inspired lawgivers, prophets, messiahs, have searched it for life and found only torment and death. Like the ancient sphinx, 
it has devoured them, because they could not explain it. Great philosophers, from Heraclitus and Plato, down to Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Kant, Fecht, Schelling and Hegel, not to mention the Indian philosophers, have written heaps of volumes and built systems as ingenious as sublime, in which they have said by the way many beautiful and grand things and discovered immortal truths, but they have left this mystery, the principal object of their transcendental investigations, as unfathomable as before. The gigantic efforts of the most wonderful geniuses that the world has known, and who, one after another for at least thirty centuries, have undertaken anew this labour of Sisyphus, have resulted only in rendering this mystery still more incomprehensible. Is it to be hoped that it will be unveiled to us by the routine speculations of some pedantic disciple of an artificially warmed over metaphysics at a time when all living and serious spirits have abandoned that ambiguous science born of a compromise, historically explicable no doubt, between the unreason of faith and sound scientific reason? It is evident that this terrible mystery is inexplicable, that is, absurd, because only the absurd admits of no explanation. It is evident that whoever finds it essential to his happiness and life must renounce his reason and return, if he can, to naive, blind, stupid faith, to repeat with Tertullianus and all sincere believers these words which sum up the very quintessence of theology. Credo quia absurdum. I believe because it is absurd. Then all discussion ceases, and nothing remains but the triumphant stupidity of faith. But immediately there arises another question. How comes an intelligent and well-informed man ever to feel the need of believing in this mystery? Nothing is more natural than that the belief in God, the creator, regulator, judge, master, cursor, saviour and benefactor of the world, should still prevail among the people, especially in the rural districts, where it is more widespread than amongst the proletariat of the cities. The people, unfortunately, are still very ignorant, and are kept in ignorance by the systematic efforts of all the governments, who consider this ignorance, not without good reason, as one of the essential conditions of their own power. Weighted down by their daily labour, deprived of leisure, of intellectual intercourse, of reading, in short, of all the means and a good portion of the stimulants that develop thought in men, the people generally accept religious traditions without criticism, and in a lump. These traditions surround them from infancy, in all the situations of life, and artificially sustained in their minds by a multitude of official poisoners of all sorts, priests and laymen, are transformed therein into a sort of mental and moral babbit, too often more powerful even than their natural good sense. There is another reason which explains and in some sort justifies the absurd beliefs of the people, namely the wretched situation in which they find themselves fatally condemned by the economic organisation of society in the most civilised countries of Europe. Reduced intellectually and morally as well as materially to the minimum of human existence, confined in their life like a prisoner in his prison, without horizon, without outlet, without even a future if we believe the economists, the people would have the singularly narrow souls and blunted instincts of the bourgeois if they did not feel a desire to escape. But of escape there are but three methods, two chimerical and a third real. The first two are the dram shop and the church, debauchery of the body or debauchery of the mind. The third is social revolution. Hence I conclude that this last will be much more potent than all the theological propagandism of the free thinkers to destroy to the last vestige the religious beliefs and dissolute habits of the people, beliefs and habits much more intimately connected than is generally supposed. In substituting for the at once illusory and brutal enjoyments of bodily and spiritual licentiousness, the enjoyments, as refined as they are real, of humanity developed in each and all, the social revolution alone will have the power to close at the same time all the dram shops and all the churches. Till then the people, taken as a whole, will believe, and if they have no reason to believe, they will have at least a right. There is a class of people who, if they do not believe, must at least make a semblance of believing. This class, comprising all the tormentors, all the oppressors and all the exploiters of humanity, priests, 
monarchs, statesmen, soldiers, public and private financiers, officials of all sorts, policemen, gendarmes, jailers and executioners, monopolists, capitalists, tax leeches, contractors and landlords, lawyers, economists, politicians of all shades, down to the smallest vendor of sweetmeats, all will repeat in unison those words of Voltaire. If God did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. For, you understand, the people must have a religion. That is the safety valve. There exists, finally, a somewhat numerous class of honest but timid souls who, too intelligent to take the Christian dogmas seriously, reject them in detail, but have neither the courage nor the strength nor the necessary resolution to summarily renounce them altogether. They abandon to your criticism all the special absurdities of religion. They turn up their noses at all the miracles, but they cling desperately to the principal absurdity, the source of all the others, to the miracle that explains and justifies all the other miracles, the existence of God. Their God is not the vigorous and powerful being, the brutally positive God of theology. It is a nebulous, diaphanous, illusory being that vanishes into nothing at the first attempt to grasp it. It is a mirage, an ignis fatux, that neither warms nor illuminates, and yet they hold fast to it, and believe that, were it to disappear, all would disappear with it. They are uncertain, sickly souls, who have lost their reckoning in the present civilization, belonging to neither the present nor the future, pale phantoms eternally suspended between heaven and earth, and occupying exactly the same position between the politics of the bourgeois and the socialism of the proletariat. They have neither the power nor the wish nor the determination to follow out their thought, and they waste their time and pains in constantly endeavouring to reconcile the irreconcilable. In public life, these are known as bourgeois socialists. With them or against them, discussion is out of the question. They are too puny. But there are a few illustrious men of whom no one will dare to speak without respect, and whose vigorous health, strength of mind and good intention no one will dream of calling in question. I need only cite the names of Mazzini, Michelet, Quinet, John Stuart Mill. Footnote. Mr. Stuart Mill is perhaps the only one whose serious idealism may be fairly doubted, and that for two reasons. First, that if not absolutely the disciple, he is a passionate admirer and adherent of the positive philosophy of Auguste Comte, a philosophy which, in spite of its numerous reservations, is really atheistic. Second, that Mr. Stuart Mill is English, and in England to proclaim oneself an atheist is to ostracise oneself, even at this late day. End footnote. Generous and strong souls, great hearts, great minds, great writers, and the first, the heroic and revolutionary regenerator of a great nation, they are all apostles of idealism, and bitter despisers and adversaries of materialism, and consequently of socialism also, in philosophy as well as in politics. Against them, then, we must discuss this question. First, let it be remarked that not one of the illustrious men I have just named, nor any other idealistic thinker of any consequence in our day, has given any attention to the logical side of this question, properly speaking. Not one has tried to settle philosophically the possibility of the divine salto mortale, from the pure and eternal regions of the spirit into the mire of the material world. Have they feared to approach this irreconcilable contradiction, and despaired of solving it after the failures of the greatest geniuses of history? Or have they looked upon it as already sufficiently well settled? That is their secret. The fact is that they have neglected the theoretical demonstration of the existence of a god, and have developed only its practical motives and consequences. They have treated it as a fact universally accepted and, as such, no longer susceptible of any doubt whatever. For sole proof thereof, limiting themselves to the establishment of the antiquity and this very universality of the belief in God. This imposing unanimity in the eyes of many illustrious men and writers, to quote only the most famous of them who eloquently expressed it, 
Joseph de Maestra, and the great Italian patriot, Giuseppe Mazzini, is of more value than all the demonstrations of science, and if the reasoning of a small number of logical and even very powerful but isolated thinkers is against it, so much the worse, they say, for these thinkers and their logic, for their universal consent, the general and primitive adoption of an idea, has always been considered the most triumphant testimony to its truth. The sentiment of the whole world, a conviction that is found and maintained always and everywhere, cannot be mistaken. It must have its root in a necessity absolutely inherent in the very nature of man. And since it has been established that all peoples, past and present, have believed and still believe in the existence of God, it is clear that those who have the misfortune to doubt it, whatever the logic that led them to this doubt, are abnormal exceptions, monsters. Thus, then, the antiquity and universality of a belief should be regarded, contrary to all science and all logic, as sufficient and unimpeachable proof of its truth. Why? Until the days of Copernicus and Galileo, everybody believed that the sun revolved about the earth. Was not everybody mistaken? What is more ancient and more universal than slavery? Cannibalism, perhaps. From the origin of historic society down to the present day, there has been always and everywhere exploitation of the compulsory labour of the masses, slaves, serfs or wage workers by some dominant minority, oppression of the people by the church and by the state. Must it be concluded that this exploitation and this oppression are necessities absolutely inherent in the very existence of human society? These are examples which show that the argument of the champions of God proves nothing. Nothing, in fact, is as universal or as ancient as the iniquitous and absurd. Truth and justice, on the contrary, are the least universal, the youngest features in the development of human society. In this fact, too, lies the explanation of a constant historical phenomenon, namely the persecution of which those who first proclaim the truth have been and continue to be the objects at the hands of the official, privileged and interested representatives of universal and ancient beliefs, and often also at the hands of the same masses who, after having tortured them, always end by adopting their ideas and rendering them victorious. To us materialists and revolutionary socialists, there is nothing astonishing or terrifying in this historical phenomenon. Strong in our conscience, in our love of truth at all hazards, in that passion for logic which of itself alone constitutes a great power and outside of which there is no thought, strong in our passion for justice and in our unshakable faith in the triumph of humanity over all theoretical and practical bestialities, strong, finally, in the mutual confidence and support given each other by the few who share our convictions, we resign ourselves to all the consequences of this historical phenomenon, in which we see the manifestation of a social law as natural, as necessary, and as invariable as all the other laws which govern the world. This law is a logical, inevitable consequences of the animal origin of human society. For in face of all the scientific, physiological, psychological and historical proofs accumulated at the present day, as well as in the face of the exploits of the Germans conquering France, which now furnish so striking a demonstration thereof, it is no longer possible to really doubt this origin. But from the moment that this animal origin of man is accepted, all is explained. History then appears to us as the revolutionary negation, now slow, apathetic, sluggish, now passionate and powerful, of the past. It consists precisely in the progressive negation of the primitive animality of man by the development of his humanity. Man, a wild beast, cousin of the gorilla, has emerged from the profound darkness of animal instinct into the light of the mind, which explains in a wholly natural way all his past mistakes and partially consoles us for his present errors. He has gone out from animal slavery, and passing through divine slavery, a temporary condition between his animality and his humanity, he is now marching on to the conquest and realisation of human liberty. Whence it results that the antiquity of a belief, of an idea, far from proving anything in its favour, 
ought on the contrary to lead us to suspect it. For behind us is our animality, and before us our humanity. Human light, the only thing that can warm and enlighten us, the only thing that can emancipate us, give us dignity, freedom and happiness, and realise fraternity among us, is never at the beginning, but, relatively to the epoch in which we live, always at the end of history. Let us then never look back, let us look ever forward, for forward is our sunlight, forward our salvation. If it is justifiable, and even useful and necessary, to turn back to study our past, it is only in order to establish what we have been and what we must no longer be, what we have believed and thought and what we must no longer believe or think, what we have done and what we must do never more. So much for antiquity. As for the universality of an error, it proves but one thing. The similarity, if not the perfect identity, of human nature in all ages and under all skies. And since it establishes that all peoples at all periods of their life have believed and still believe in God, we must simply conclude that the divine idea, an outcome of ourselves, is an error historically necessary in the development of humanity, and ask why and how it was produced in history, and why an immense majority of the human race still accept it as a truth. Until we shall account to ourselves for the manner in which the idea of a supernatural or divine world was developed and had to be developed in the historical evolution of the human conscience, all our scientific conviction of its absurdity will be in vain. Until then we shall never succeed in destroying it in the opinion of the majority, because we shall never be able to attack it in the very depths of the hut-man being where it had birth. Condemned to a fruitless struggle, without issue and without end, we should forever have to content ourselves with fighting it solely on the surface, in its innumerable manifestations whose absurdity will be scarcely beaten down by the blows of common sense before it will reappear in a new form no less nonsensical. While the root of all the absurdities that torment the world, belief in God, remains intact, it will never fail to bring forth new offspring. Thus, at the present time, in certain sections of the higher society, spiritualism tends to establish itself upon the ruins of Christianity. It is not only in the interest of the masses, it is in that of the health of our own minds, that we should strive to understand the historic genesis the succession of causes which developed and produced the idea of God in the consciousness of men. In vain shall we call and believe ourselves atheists until we comprehend these courses, for until then we shall always suffer ourselves to be more or less governed by the clamours of this universal conscience whose secret we have not discovered, and, considering the natural weakness of even the strongest individual against the all-powerful influence of the social surroundings that trammel him, we are always in danger of relapsing sooner or later, in one way or another, into the abyss of religious absurdity. Examples of these shameful conversions are frequent in society today. End of chapter 1 This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist.